final item of business today is the Members' Debate on Motion Number 8729 in the name of Jenny Mara on International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could please press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Jenny Mara to open the debate. Seven minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Tomorrow is International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation, a day where the world will take a stand against child torture, against the heinous physical abuse of women, and against a practice that has no place in society, yet unfortunately still affects far too many across the globe today. The World Health Organization estimates that between 120 and 140 million women have been subject to female genital mutilation worldwide, and that every year another 3 million girls become at risk from the procedure, which partially or wholly removes or injures their genitalia for non-medical, mainly faith or tradition-based reasons. And I am glad that we have the opportunity today to add our opposition to this barbaric act in Scotland, because Scotland is by no means immune to it. The Scottish Government estimate that as many as 3,000 girls are at risk from female genital mutilation in Scotland, with that number set to grow with the new census population estimates. Now let us be clear, even if there were just one girl at risk from this torture in Scotland, we must surely acknowledge that the severity of the crime still warrants robust action. But with 3,000 girls who have been identified as possible targets of torture in our communities, it is absolutely astonishing that there have been no police reports filed with the Procurator Fiscal, no prosecutions and not one conviction for female genital mutilation in nearly 30 years of criminal law against it in this country. FGM has been illegal... Yes, absolutely. Minister. I what you're saying, but then the same is true for England and Wales, with a population of nearly 10 times that. So I hope she's not trying to suggest that there's something strange about the prosecution system in Scotland. The issue is a very difficult one to bring forward. I hope she'll accept that the same is the case for England and Wales. It's a very sensitive issue. Any comparison, I don't think, presiding officer, with the situation in England and Wales. I'm talking about the jurisdiction that we represent in Scotland and the, our criminal law has law against it. And this parliament itself, in 2005, re-established that law and made it an extraterritorial crime also. And that's, I'm just talking about the, the people we represent in this parliament. Because female genital mutilation has been illegal in, across the UK and Scotland since 1985, and it was again criminalised in Scotland in 2005 with the Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Act. And I think it would be remiss of us, presiding officer, if the starting point in this debate was not to acknowledge that despite the best will with which those acts were passed, our laws have failed so far to protect thousands of children at risk of torture in Scotland. And that is because even the best laws in the world become but lines on paper if they are not respected, enforced and given the resource to be effective. The Equal Opportunities Inquiry, the Committee's inquiry into FGM, which is taking place now, has shown that so much of what we know about FGM in Scotland is based on nothing more than anecdotal evidence at the moment. And to my mind, we have two ways of looking at this. Firstly, we can say that because we know so little, it is unlikely that FGM is a serious problem. Or secondly, we take the view that yes, we know so little, but we will not risk the lives and long-term health of children and women in the hope that FGM is not as widespread as, as the numbers of those at risk would have us believe. Presiding officer, we know that those who have undergone FGM in Scotland, we, for them, we can and must do better even if that means engaging with the very sensitive issues, as the Minister says, of culture, race and the bodies of young girls. Yes, absolutely. Because, Chris Crawford. And because I, I, I show my ignorance here, so forgive me, because I just don't know the answer. Uh, I was very interested to hear what Jenny Mara was saying. Uh, how many complaints have actually... Do we know how many complaints have actually been made to the police of this particular practice? 
So that would help under, me understand the scale of the problem that we face in the justice system. Jen um, I think Bruce Crawford asked a good question. I have put down several parliamentary questions on the amount of information that, that, that the police have. There hasn't been one police report filed with the Procurator Fiscal. It's my understanding that police do work with communities, but I think more needs to be done. And that is the, the purpose of this debate today, to see what more can be done. Because we know 3,000 women, and possibly more with the new census, are at risk of this in Scotland, but currently is still continuing to be done. It's child torture in our communities. And for that reason, we, we must do more. I think we must work with communities, presiding officer, that we know are engaged with the issue of FGM to challenge the deeply ingrained perception that it is okay to mutilate children in the name of faith or tradition. And while it is so important to do this through partnership working, education and building trust, it cannot mean maintaining our woeful record on enforcing the law, because this is a law against child torture in Scotland. Our public health, immigration and social services must work together better in partnership to provide services for the survivors of FGM. Because unless we build an environment where women and girls feel safe to come forward, unless we create a viable alternative to undergoing the procedure in the first place, we will never be able to start identifying and reducing the risk. And lastly, presiding officer, I believe that the Scottish Government must lead the way in coordinating Scotland's approach and response to FGM. Because without leadership direction and continual focus and resources to tackle the problem, we won't be able to see the trend of growing risk turn around for the better. I want to warmly welcome the funding the Government has made available to carry out a scoping exercise on the extent of FGM in Scotland. This is an important first step on the road to bettering our approach. But that scoping exercise must not be the ends of our efforts, it must be the beginning. And so I'm asking the Scottish Government tonight to present the findings of that scoping exercise to Parliament this spring with an action plan on tackling FGM and detail of what resource will be dedicated to that action plan. The size and the scale of the challenge around FGM is such that we must keep it in constant focus. By committing to that action plan before Parliament tonight, the Government can acknowledge their role as leading that cause and that action. Presiding officer, there is no role for torture in Scotland's communities, and that is exactly what this is. This is child torture in our communities. There is no role, role for child abuse. Our laws have failed these children, and we must now rededicate ourselves to making them work. I hope that the government will commit to taking my suggested action tonight, and that we can return to this chamber on the International Day of Zero Tolerance to FGM next year with a more successful story to tell. Thank you. Thank you. There are a number of members who wish to speak in this debate. I hope to get everyone in. Speeches of four minutes, please. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to congratulate Jenny Mara on securing this debate and for her opening speech. Female genital mutilation is abhorrent. And on the 10th of December 2001, more than 12 years ago, I submitted a motion to this Parliament condemning it. And it's shocking that it continues to be such an issue, such a huge issue. Many cultures in Africa, Asia, South America and the Middle East condone and encourage the practice of the partial or total removal of the external female genitalia and other injuries to the female genital organs for non-medical reasons to supposedly preserve a young woman's purity within their society. This procedure is often done without anaesthesia, sterile tools or medication to help the child heal. Parents force their daughters to have their genitals mutilated at ages as young as a few weeks after birth to improve the likelihood of a favourable marriage to enhance the prosperity and status of the family. These cultures believe that this practice will prevent their, their young women from having sex outside of marriage and keep them pure for their future husband. Of course, in patriarchal societies, there is no such imposition on men. This horrible tradition is enforced and perpetuated by women who see the ritual as an essential part of becoming a woman and a legitimate member of the community. Leaders of different faiths have rejected FGM, although some communities believe it is done for religious reasons. In Niger, 55% of Christian girls and women have undergone the practice, compared to only 2% of Muslim women and girls. 
But in Togo, 21% of Muslim women and girls have undergone FGM compared to only 1% of Christian girls and women, showing how the practice differs even within religious groups and shows that it is not actually uh, as faith-based as may be assumed. Although these cultures see this practice as an essential part of a woman's life, female genital mutilation is an inhumane and repressive practice done to young females who suppress their sexuality and control their bodies. This cruel practice can cause many adverse health problems to the victim throughout her lifetime. When the procedure is first performed, the girls are at high risk of severe pain, shock, bleeding, bacterial infection, injury to nearby tissue and psychological damage comparable to post-traumatic stress disorder. In the long term, girls and women who suffer this procedure often uh, also suffer recurrent bladder and urinary tract infections, cysts, infertility and complications during intercourse and childbirth. Forced female circumcision is a human rights violation, child abuse, torture and demeaning towards a female population. Even in 19th century Britain and America, funnily enough, although not funny in an amusing sense, but strangely I should say, it was considered a cure for women with a variety of clinical diagnosis, again in an era where uh, women's sexuality was often very severely suppressed. This ritual may still be practiced uh, by minority ethnic groups that have immigrated to Scotland, which st who still have the cultural uh, pressure to uphold this tradition. There have been two acts, as Jenny Mara pointed out, that outlawed this practice. The Prohibition of Female Genital Mutilation Scotland Act in 2005 furthered provisions to make it uh, illegal uh, um, following the Act of 2000, uh, 1985 and also ensured that um, the practice, um, if carried out, could uh, result in a prison term of 5 to 14 years. But not one case, of course, has been brought forward, although I understand that 10 have officially been reported. Many of the women and children that have undergone painful mutilation may in fact be too frightened or ashamed to speak out about the harm done to them as they face pressure from within their cultural group to remain silent and fear the stigma that could be placed on them by those who do not share their cultural identity. Tomorrow marks International Day of Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation and people in Scotland and countries around the world will gather to show that they will not stand idly by and permit uh, this horrible practice to continue. Advocacy groups attempt to eliminate this immune practice uh, um, over the last four decades and continue to work, often in very difficult uh, conditions. Presenting officer, our country cannot be seen to have a soft stance toward female circumcision. Um, and of course, it is alleged that, uh, that this does actually take place here, although we want to hear more evidence that it does. My view is it's a form of racism to stand by and let this happen to people from other ethnic minorities when we ourselves would not tolerate it in other groups. Everyone's individual rights and freedoms should be equally protected and more needs to be done to stop people from subjecting their daughters, granddaughters and nieces to this horrible, eh, scarring torture. I have more to say, but I realise there are people who wish to speak and will conclude, therefore, at that point. Presenting Thank, you. Thank you very much. I call Nanette Mellon to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I too commend Jenny Mara for securing this debate to mark the International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. I have to say it came as something of a shock to me to learn that nearly 30 years after the Conservative Westminster Government in 1985 outlawed the practice of female circumcision, as it was euphemistically called then, and nine years after this Parliament legislated against FGM, there has not been, we're told, a single police report prosecution or conviction for this brutal assault on young women and girls from certain ethnic communities. I was a member of the Equal Opportunities Committee, which took evidence at stage one of the FGM bill in 2005. And I remember the harrowing accounts from witnesses of the agonizing procedures endured by the victims of FGM, often performed without anaesthetic and using dirty makeshift and shared instruments. As Kenneth Gibson has said, these girls and young women can suffer from very serious immediate health consequences, such as severe shock, pain and bleeding, which may be fatal. And they often get urine retention and localised infection. Long-term obstetric and gynaecological problems, urinary tract infections and incontinence can cause severe suffering and the psychological consequences of FGM can ruin the lives of many victims. Sadly, FGM is a very deep-seated cultural practice in several African countries and also in the Middle East and Asia. Its increasing appearance in the Western world is usually in immigrant and refugee populations, with, as we've heard, 3,000 women and girls at risk in Scotland today uh, and that number likely to rise. It isn't a requirement of any religion, but rather it is seen as a rite of passage to womanhood and a requirement for marriageability. 
And hard though it is for us to believe, it's often done at the hand of older women in a community who have themselves undergone FGM. To them, it's a necessary ritual, an act of love to ensure the best future for their daughters and granddaughters. It's difficult to run it to ground because the practice is kept very private within communities. And because relatives are often involved, statistics are hard to come by. As I said at stage three of the FGM Bill in 2005, it will probably take generations to eradicate and it will require education reinforced by law to overcome such an entrenched custom. I felt at the time that whilst the new law was unlikely to lead to many prosecutions, it should serve to raise awareness within the communities, communities affected. And if coupled with education within these communities and of health education and social work professionals, then it would become more widely recognised. But to hear that we're no further on nine years later is really quite depressing. And I'm pleased to learn that the Scottish Government is now committed with the Scottish Refugee Council to try to assess the actual scale of FGM across Scotland, because this violation of a significant, if small, section of our society should not be tolerated. Urgent action needs to be taken to protect these vulnerable people from the barbaric customs endemic in their communities, because they are a serious abuse of their human rights. Indeed, FGM shouldn't be tolerated anywhere in the world in the 21st century, and its eradication must be tackled on an international scale. A country like Scotland must not simply pay lip service to the International Day of Zero Tolerance of FGM. We must make serious efforts to find the perpetrators of this brutal practice and to enforce the 2005 legislation so that the relatively small number of very vulnerable people in some of Scotland's ethnic communities who are at risk of female genital mutilation can receive the legal protection they deserve as our fellow citizens. I will conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, by thanking Gerry Mara for alerting us to the lack of progress to date on eliminating this awful practice and for her sustained efforts to help its victims and those who are currently at risk of being made to endure the severe personal traumas of FGM. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Alison McInnes. Uh, President, <coughs> President, I congratulate uh, Jenny Mara on bringing forward this important uh, uh, motion and also commend the, the uh, passionate and empathetic way she has championed this and other causes. Uh, female genital mutilation is an appalling human rights abuse that we must do everything we can to completely eradicate. I believe we must approach this with the right kind of cultural sensitivity, not the kind of cultural sensitivity that turns a blind eye to human rights abuses and becomes a kind of racism, as, as Kenny Gibson said, when taken to extremes. I'm a great admirer of multiculturalism in general, but human rights always trumps uh, multiculturalism, and we can't make an exception for any groups of people. Now, the kind of cultural sensitivity I have in mind is, firstly, a sensitivity that recognises the reality that this problem exists to a significant extent in certain communities. Secondly, I believe that we must recognise that effective action comes from working on the front line with the communities effective, effect, affected and in ways that have a chance uh, of being uh, effective. So we must uh, support organisations doing frontline work, and I certainly know one such organisation that has been doing that, and I hope that the government uh, will continue to give it and any other frontline organisations the support that uh, they need. I think it's only by that frontline work that it is possible to uncover the extent uh, of this crime, because it is a crime that is hidden uh, in many cases. But I think we have to believe the estimates that have been made on the basis uh, of the census, and that leads to the conclusion that there are uh, three to 4,000 uh, uh, girls at risk in Scotland at present. I give way. John Finney. Yeah, no, I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. Would the member recognise that key to that is using the correct terminology? So, for instance, for a lot of these communities, female genital mutilation means nothing. There's euphemisms used. A child being taken to a party, for instance, is a term, as I understand, that's used. So key is to communicate in people's own language in every respect. Malcolm Chisholm. Well, well, I agree entirely with that. In a kind of way, that's a very good example of the, of the kind of positive cultural sensitivity that I have in mind. Uh, the importance of people working on the front line who understand how they can effectively work 
uh, with the people, uh, the communities that are affected, and how they can actually gain their confidence and possibly uh, make progress. But clearly, mainstream services are also crucial in this, and they need to link up with each other as well as with the kind of frontline organisations that I've referred to. Health is clearly crucial here. I'm told uh, that, um, that, that, that uh, women survivors are not getting the health care uh, that they need, and in many cases, of course, they're not being identified at all. So health professionals need training in general so that they can ask the questions that are required and give examinations where that uh, is appropriate. Midwives, I think, are particularly important, and I'm glad in that sense that the Minister uh, mentioned the Royal College of Midwives uh, in, in recent announcements about this. They have a report uh, about identifying, recording and reporting the issue, and I know that Gillian Smith of the RCM is doing some work on that at present. So that is clearly very important. Passing on information uh, is uh, also uh, a part of this, of course, since this is a child protection issue and those uh, at risk must be uh, regarded as such. I noticed that Chief Superintendent Jill Emery recently said that all children of FGM survivors should be on the child protection register. So I, I don't know whether that, that there, could, there could be exceptions where people are confident that their child or children are not at risk, but clearly uh, we should listen seriously to what she is saying. And the police in general are clearly very, very uh, important uh, in this regard, and um, we, we, we mu other agencies must work clearly with them, and when information is passed on to the police, they must be prepared to uh, take serious action about this. I noticed, last thing I'll say, uh, the Minister mentioned England. There was very interesting reports in the Times on Friday about England, and one, one issue was that there's now going to be an investigation of the police in England to see whether they're doing everything that's, uh, that's required. And the other big issue highlighted in the, in the English context in that article was about schools and the failure of schools to, to play a role in this as well. So all the agencies are important. The scoping exercise is a good start, but only if it leads to action. And I uh, support, final word, Jenny Mara's call for an action programme following that piece of work. Many thanks. I now call Alison McInnes to be followed by Hans Alamalik. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I too congratulate Jenny Mara on securing this important debate. On the eve of the UN-sponsored International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation, I add my voice to those calling for an end to this most brutal abuse of girls and women. FGM is recognised internationally as a violation of the human rights of girls and women. It reflects deep-rooted inequality between the sexes and constitutes an extreme and brutal form of discrimination against women. It is nearly always carried out on minors and is a violation of the rights of children. The practice also violates a person's right to health, security, physical integrity, the right to be free from torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment, and indeed the right to life when the procedure results in death. According to UNICEF, more than 125 million women worldwide are currently living with the consequences of FGM. Concentrated in countries across Western, Central and Eastern Africa, FGM is also practised in communities in the Middle East, Asia and the Americas, and of course in the diaspora communities all over the world. It is usually performed on children. In 50% of practising countries, girls undergo FGM before the age of five. It is generally carried out, as others have said, by unskilled practitioners who use unsterilised instruments and no anaesthetic, risking potentially lethal infection. Other consequences include severe pain during urination, menstruation, sexual intercourse and childbirth, and of course psychological trauma. This systematic violation of women's rights has for too long been a taboo subject, but throughout the world calls for an end to FGM are gaining strength. In 2012, under the leadership of the African Group and with strong EU support, the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted a landmark resolution. In March 2013, my Liberal Democrat colleague Lynn Featherstone, Minister for International Development, announced the biggest ever international investment, £35 million, for eradicating the practice. And in November last year, the European Commission released an action plan on ending FM FGM. So there is a growing momentum for change, but we must take action here in Scotland too. The Scottish Government has estimated, as others have said, that at least 3,000 women and girls are at risk here. That is based on a pro rata estimate, but nevertheless that working estimate exposes a lamentable and much neglected child protection issue for Scotland to tackle. As others have said, it has been a specific criminal offence in the UK since 1985, and yet there has not been a single prosecution. 
A recent BBC programme revealed that currently the majority of health boards were unable to say how many cases they had encountered. Less than a third of our councils had any local guidelines on FGM and the police had had no referrals from health boards. How can that be? Well, according to 17-year-old Fama Mohammed from Bristol, who is leading the Guardian newspaper's campaign to end, end FGM, it's because, and she says, people just don't talk about it, doctors don't check for it, and teachers don't teach it. She is campaigning for our schools to do more. She said, and I quote, we need to act now. Many girls are sent away to be cut over the summer holidays. Some are cut at home. They call it the cutting season. If every head teacher was given the information they need to talk about FGM to students and parents, we could reach every girl who is at risk before the holidays. We could convince families not to send their daughters to be cut, and we could help girls who are at risk. We could break the cycle so that the next generation is safe. You know, she's right. The legal framework and enforcement is important, but it's not sufficient to end the FGM. Changes in attitudes and beliefs in the affected communities will be key. Most survivors of FGM need help to cope with the short and long-term consequences of the procedure. Giving them adequate support would help raise their awareness of the damaging health consequences of the practice. Some countries, such as Belgium and France and Italy, have set up health centres specialising in care for victims. And while health professionals are best placed to lead on identification, prevention and treatment, there are many partners we should draw together in education and social services and COPFS and the police, as well as the minority ethnic women's organisations working to raise awareness, such as Salea, Dignity Alert, Research Forum, Shakti Women's Aid and the Scottish Refugee Council. The Scottish... Gentlemen, very briefly, please. I thank the member very much for giving way. Is the member suggesting, or would she agree, that it might be an idea for the Scottish Government to send information packs to every head teacher in the country outlining the risks and, and the times of year that she suggests so that they have that information in the schools? I certainly Ask hope that um, the, the, the Minister will, will learn from that and, and, and reflect on whether that is something that we can take forward. I believe the Scottish Government must show leadership on this by ensuring that it empowers and resources the kind of robust, sustained, multidisciplinary response that really is required to end the risk for children living in Scotland. Girls and women in Scotland and around the world have a right to have control over their own bodies and live a life free from the fear of violence. Thank you. I call Hans Ali Malik to be followed by Marco Biaggi. Thank you very much and good evening, Presiding Officer. First of all, I take the opportunity to thank Jenny Mara for bringing this very important debate to the Chamber. I think uh, it's uh, a very worthy and a very important cause. International Day f of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation is an important marking point. I, I see that the, the Minister went into auto-defense, and I, I really want to make it very clear from the very start that this is not meant as um, uh, something that uh, we would blame her personally for something. It is not meant as criticism, but it is meant on how to go forward, and uh, I hope that she will accept that spirit. Um, the, in uh, 2013, UNESCO established that more than 125 million women and girls from 29 countries worldwide were affected by female genital mutilation. The origin of these practices is unclear, but it is clear that it has been practiced for thousands of years and it's just not going to disappear overnight. The whole point of having an International Day of Zero Tolerance is to FGM is that we take strong approach and share the information that we have. We learn from it and tackle the problem in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in other parts of the world, including the United Kingdom. FGM was brought to my attention by a constituent when I first became a member of Scottish Parliament, and I began to read about it, and I was quite frankly horrified and disturbed. I come from a culture where I see circumcision and various other mutilations that happen as a child, but I was, I was particularly disturbed about this, and I also was very disturbed about the fact that it was happening to very young girls, more importantly, which, was, which meant that they had no choice in the matter, and which meant that it scarred them not only for all their life, but perhaps also gave them uh, uh, complications in health, which meant that they couldn't do anything about it. It's something that's not, it's not reversible. Hence, I think that I, I really felt very strongly about this issue, and I've been discussing it with many people. And one of the, one of the things that I've picked up 
clearly is that this is something that is kept very close within the community. And there is a lot of pressure applied to young people that this is a must for them and they shouldn't be sharing it because people don't understand. They use various excuses. They make them feel that you know they would be unclean, unpure if they didn't go through the process. And they're almost made to feel that it's, a, it's something that they need to be proud of and they must have this done, which is a ridiculous attitude to have. But nevertheless, people have practiced it for so long, they believe that what they're doing is in fact true. And this is why it's very important that we, we need to have stiff sentences against those people who put our young through that experience. And they are our young. There are, there are young Scots who are living here, and, and they're, they're having to go through this uh, unfortunate issue. And therefore, I think it's very important. I was also speaking to a doctor from Kurdistan uh, who's, who's, who's very active in this area. And he spoke to me about how FGM was uh, quite widespread in, in Iraq and in particular in Kurdistan, which he, even he was surprised about. Uh, however, he says that his government has taken very robust steps to deal with the issue. They do public speaks, they, they, they talk about it on television, they, they do inf information uh, conferences, and most importantly, they send the right signals out from the government in the sense that they've, made, they've outlawed it. Now, that's a, that's a very brave step for a country like Kurdistan to take, and I think, you know, although we are part of the way already there in terms of legislation, but what we have unfortunately not grasped is how we need to penetrate the community and actually protect those, those people. So um, I'm, I, I've listened to some very good ideas about you know, sharing information in schools. I've, 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 I've heard about perhaps setting up some sort of task force that we deal with this issue uh, with some more robustness. And hopefully next year when we do come here, Minister, although I'm not holding you responsible today, I'll certainly be holding you responsible in a year's time if you don't meet any success. Because I think it's very important we send the right signal out. It's very important to say to our young that this government actually does care for you and we will take all the measures that we need to to ensure their health and safety and the quality of life. And that's absolutely paramount. And therefore, I, I, I agree with all the sentiments that people have shared with me this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Mark Biagi to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Circumcision, growing up and cleansing were euphemisms for female genital mutilation that the Equal Opportunities Committee heard uh, were in common use when we had our round table just a week ago. But they weren't the worst. As John Finney has already said, going to a party the spectre of a child being told by their family that they were going on holiday, that they were going to be taken to some celebration, and visiting their relatives, only to then have to undergo a, a violation of themselves and their body in their earliest and most vulnerable years. That, to me, was the most disturbing thing I heard. The committee's roundtable included representatives of a great range of organisations active on the issue, including one uh, Fatou Balde, who I hope I have pronounced the, the name correctly of, uh, who is also a survivor herself. We touched on a great many issues. One of them was the, the question of data, just working out how many of these uh, events have taken place, because all of the data is drawn from census projections, how many people come from the, the so-called at-risk communities. And while we have all of these other uh, reports, you know, one person's anecdote is another's qualitative evidence, and one of the points that was put to us was that it seems very, very strange that we know there are so many families from these at-risk communities, and yet no one has apparently ever presented to a GP. And is that really any wonder? You know, in order to have a child report, they would have to criminalise their parents, lead to the prosecution of their own families. The, the relationships there, the power relationships within the family are clearly very strong, not to mention the relationships within the community on the family itself. It was also pointed out even that we have to be careful about terms. As John Finney had said, female genital mutilation is not a term that is in common use. And a person presented with a question on that at, by a health worker might well simply say no, not recognising it. But the overwhelming view of that session was that to tackle FGM, we must be sensitive. Not tolerant, permissive or lax, but the kind of positive sensitivity that Malcolm Chisholm put uh, so well. Makami McCrum of the Kenyan, Women's, uh, Kenyan Women in Scotland Association made a suggestion that the, the, the broad attack on the community or how it could be taken that way by people who are sensitive to portrayals 
that are negative in media and in debate would just cause the problem to be uh, withdrawn from and hidden. Amnesty International has campaigned for a Europe-wide approach to FGM and has said that the debate in the UK about more prosecutions misses the point. And legal repression, although it may have its place, is not the best answer. We need to work with the communities where this happens to try to change attitudes, not to drive the problem further underground. We should consider the best interests of the children before we rush to send their parents to prison. There are experiences in other European countries. France has a very aggressive programme of screening, which was pointed out to us, well, would only re-victimise those who and uh, re-traumatise those who had been through the situation, the experience, and would subject many innocent people to an invasive examination. Similarly, we've heard parallels about the need for aggressive screening with sexual abuse, where the, the rates are unfortunately much higher based on all of our estimates. But we did hear good news. We heard from uh, Ms McCrum about action in Kenya that's taken incidents down from 90% to 25%. That's still 25% too much, but that is progress. Burkina Faso has done likewise. Anela Anwar from Roshni said, we need to put a lot of sustainable effort into community engagement programmes. Without engaging communities, men, women, girls on it, and empowering young girls and women to make their own choices while staying safe we will not get anywhere. That too is the view of the Scottish Refugee Council as expressed to the committee and to members today. You can't do this without female empowerment. And we have to as well have a healthcare training so that there is a sensitivity out there so that people can see the warning signs both in healthcare but also in schooling. Could I ask you, you know, to draw to a close? I've read, I've read some apologies for FGM from anthropologists and others, and, and they disgust me, frankly, as much as the practice itself. FGM is gender based violence, FGM is child abuse, and it is grotesque, and it must end. Many thanks. And finally, Margaret McCulloch. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome today's debate in interna on the International Day of Zero Tolerance of Female Genital Mutilation, an important day that will be recognised tomorrow. I am grateful to Jenny Mara for securing this debate where we can take a stand against this brutal and wholly unacceptable tradition. On Thursday last week, it says before, the Equal Opportunities Committee held a very informative evidence session with organisations and experts in FGM in Scotland, including Dignity Alert and Research Forum Rosney, the Scottish Refugee Council, the Kenyan Women in Scotland's Association, the NSPCC Scotland, and both Women's Support Project Rape Crisis in Glasgow and Dr Una O'Brien of Queen Margaret University. We considered a future inquiry into FGM in Scotland, and I want to convey to the Chamber some of the ideas we heard during the short time I have today. First of all, with International Zero Tolerance Day in mind, I want to stress that FGM is a global issue. Tackling FGM is, a, is as much about an international response led by the United Nations and the World Health Organisation as the Scottish Government and local communities here in Scotland. The WHO uh, estimates that between 120 and 140 million girls and women are living with the consequences of FGM worldwide. The European Parliament estimates 500,000 girls and women have experienced FGM in Europe. And as my colleague Jenny Mara says earlier, Scotland, we've got 300,000 300, women and girls are estimated to be at risk. FGM is mo most prevalent in parts of Africa, Asia and the Middle East. But movement across borders means that women and girls born here with family connections to those regions can be just at risk as women or girls born there. And in our evidence at the committee, um, I was really surprised and, and how effective this initiative is down in England and that women within these regions that live in uh, England actually have a passport and the passport confirms that FGM actually hasn't been carried out on the young girls and the women. And when they go abroad to visit their families, they can actually show this passport to their families and say, look, this is legal. If I go back and my daughter goes back and we've actually had this done, I will actually go to jail and I won't then have the money to pay, to send to use, to help use uh, in your country. And this seems to be a very effective deterrent. So maybe that's something the Minister could actually investigate and look uh, into. It's simple and it does seem really, really effective. 
But, President Officer, if we as policymakers are to banish FGM to history, we need to understand why practising communities sustain these traditions, which are so acceptable, and how we discuss FGM is very, very important. It must not be tolerated, but equally we have to be conscious of how we engage with the minority communities on the sensitive issues of culture, race and the bodies of young girls. Standing up to FGM in Scotland is about as much mo more than what is in the statute book. We have to build capacity to engage with practising communities and raise awareness among those who work with but may not belong to practising communities themselves. We need to support engagement with practice communities to educate people about the realities of FGM and the law in Scotland and to tackle the pressures that many of these women in practice and communities face. We also have to make sure that we are working with organisations like DARF to develop and share good practice, training healthcare and social work professionals to identify those who are at risk and support those who have been mutilated. But let's be clear, one of our witnesses says to the committee, if persuasion and prevention does not work, then the only option left is prosecution. FGM is unacceptable in a fair and equal Scotland. It is an abuse of human rights and it must not be tolerated. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now invite Shona Robinson to respond to the debate. Minister, seven minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, thanks to Jenny Mara, who brought forward the motion before Parliament today, and all those who have participated in tonight's debate, recognising that tomorrow marks the International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation. I think debates such as this along with internationally recognised days to mark zero tolerance of FGM are extremely valuable in raising awareness of what is a global issue, as many members have said. However, we must recognise that those who are victims or who are at risk of this practice are affected every day, that they live in fear of FGM being perpetrated upon them or by living with the, the horrifying implications of what has already been done to them. As others have said, FGM is a child protection issue. It is a form of child abuse because children are not in a position to make a choice. It's forced upon them and it is a, a brutal practice. It blights the lives of those affected and, as the, the motion states, it's an abuse of the human rights of women and girls. From the contributions today, it's clear that we are all in agreement that FGM is a practice that has no place in a, a modern and multicultural Scotland. As I said in the Violence Against Women debate on the 17th of December last year, female genital mutilation will be included in Scotland's strategy to tackle violence against women. This strategy will be the, the first of its kind in Scotland, reflecting the spectrum of violence defined as violence against women and will be published in the summer following consultation early uh, this year. And as a second key document for tackling FGM, our child protection guidelines used by all children-related services includes a section on FGM. As others have said, we know that from the data from the 2001 census that there are uh, nearly 3,000 women between the ages of 0 and 49 living in Scotland and born in an FGM practising country. That does not mean, of course, that all those women have been abused in this way, only that they may be at risk. And that's why it's vitally important to ensure that we understand what the available statistics are actually telling us. For example, Nina Murray from the Scottish Refugee Council said in her evidence to the Equal Opportunities Committee on uh, the 30th of January that prevalence may be very high in a country, but certain groups in that country might not be practising FGM practice tends to be located in particular ethnic groups or communities. We've recognised that statistics alone will only tell us so much and that we need to ensure that our understanding goes beyond just numbers. Therefore, I was pleased to announce uh, back in December in that the Violence Against Women debate that the Scottish Government was going to provide funding to the Scottish Refugee Council and the Women's Support Project to carry out a project which will produce a baseline of information to help inform the work to tackle female genital mutilation. The project, scheduled to be completed by the autumn of this year, will culminate in the publication of a report outlining and refining the available data, gaps in information and recommendations for ways forward with community and statutory partners. We will look closely at all of the findings and recommendations from that report. I'm happy to share 
uh, that report with Parliament and look at what action is required to uh, take, be taken at that stage. But I think we should allow the project to get on with its work and come up with those recommendations. In Scotland, female genital mutilation is, of course, punishable by up to 14 years imprisonment. And we acknowledge that there have been no pr prosecutions for female genital mutilation. But that, as I said earlier, is also the case in England and Wales. That tells us that it's a very complex issue. And I was struck by what Marco Biagio says, that you know, it, it, it is not just about prosecution. And uh, although you know, we would all like to, to see um, people being held to account for their actions, just a minute, held to account for their actions, it is um, much more complex than just an issue of prosecution, given the family dynamics involved. Um, and therefore, it is quite wrong, I think, to suggest that somehow Scotland is in any way a soft touch for FGM. There's no evidence for that. But we obviously want to see um, action taken to make sure that the girls are protected. I'll take an intervention. Jenny Mara. I thank the Minister for giving way. Will she consider the proposal to send information packs to head teachers throughout Scotland? Um, giving information on these um, particular times of year so as a public health initiative? Well, Minister. we've set up a, a project to come forward with recommendations. I think we should ask the project which has the expertise and is going to be going out and consulting about what should be done to allow them to come back and tell us what they think should happen. If that's one of the recommendations, clearly we will look at that. But there's no point in setting up a project to come forward with recommendations and not listen to those recommendations. Um, as I already mentioned, the work being taken forward by the Scottish Refugee Council and the Women's Support Project will be very valuable in providing us with much more accurate evidence-based uh, estimates of prevalence and risk in, in Scotland. We know that it's a very difficult and sensitive issue with a number of possible reasons why victims may feel unable or unwilling to report it to the police or other authorities. Therefore, we need to ensure that what we're doing will meet the needs of those affected and who may be at risk. And we don't underestimate how difficult it is for someone from a practising community to come forward. Um, if it was easy, people would have and there would have been prosecutions. I think the fact that there hasn't been tells us how difficult it is. That makes our work really important to raise awareness among communities, to bring about attitudinal change and to encourage reporting of female genital mutilation by women, girls and men, all the more important. Training is hugely important, raising awareness to address the complex issues. And as part of our work in this area, we're in discussion with the Women's Support Project to develop a range of information and training materials on FGM and again, be happy to share those with Parliament. We also recognise that while legislation, prevalence data, information and awareness raising rightly inform parts of our strategy to tackle FGM, we must continue to look at the expertise of those such as midwives, along with other health professionals, including doctors, nurses and health visitors, who can often play a crucial role in identifying girls at risk, recording incidents and offering support and onward referral to women. And that's why we've initiated discussions with the director of the Royal College of Midwives in Scotland to discuss the recommendations made in the intercollegiate report tackling FGM in the UK the uh, recommendations for identifying, recording and reporting. Reports such as this provide a, a valuable source of expertise in helping us to consider how we can seek to ensure really effective multi-agency collaboration. It's not just health professionals who have a role to play though, as has been mentioned, the involvement of teachers, social workers and police officers is vital. As has been said, the um, Equal Opportunities Committee met with stakeholders on the 30th of January who are experts in tackling the issues that surround FGM in order to inform the remit of a potential inquiry into FGM. I very much welcome that and I would like to see, see if we can uh, align the Scottish Government work with the inquiry that the committee under the, 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 the chair of Margaret McCullough, McCulloch takes forward and hopefully together we can bring forward some good uh, recommendations for, for action. Uh, to affect uh, change. All of which I've outlined are intended to strengthen our response to FGM and complement measures already in place. Those measures include engaging with people from communities affected, working closely with police, health professionals, social work, education, 
to share good practice and promote awareness of the prevention of FGM and by funding voluntary organisations that provide support to victims of FGM, but also looking at imaginative solutions like the one that Margaret McCullough mentioned earlier on around the passport, and I will look into that uh, in more detail. Um, just to, to, to conclude, um, I want to recognise the work that is being done uh, each and every day by those who are striving to eradicate FGM, be that uh, uh, by raising awareness, supporting victims, or by working to inform our response to what is a horrific practice. But I think it is important that only by listening to the experts, by listening to the communities and people who have been affected, can we really begin to get under the radar to tackle what is a, a very difficult issue, one that is conducted in private and which uh, communities um, are, are very, uh, um, it's very difficult to get people to come forward, as has already been said. But there is more we can do, and I think some of the suggestions being made tonight uh, will be ones that we will uh, take forward in our consideration, and I'm very happy to report back to Parliament once we, we've done the work on that. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes Jenny Mara's debate on International Day of Zero Tolerance to Female Genital Mutilation, and I now close this meeting of Parliament.